<laughs> My name is Peter Juven, and I'm dean of the faculty at the college today. My name is Jack Stark, and I was uh, president here for a while. <laughs> But I was the dean of the faculty. I'm still a professor of chemistry at Carnegie. And Tony actually hired me back in 1999. So you have, you have uh, th represented up here on stage folks that have experience with the curriculum from various decades of uh, service here at the college. And this presentation is basically to give you kind of a remember when and then and now sort of look at what the curriculum at CMC was like from 1963 to 1993 to today. I always feel it's great to take a look back at the old catalogs. I actually brought the 63 catalog with me today because I want to read a passage from it for you. But this is the opening page of the 63 catalog with a quote from President Benson at the time. And it says that our college is devoted to the education of young men for leadership in business or government. We therefore give all of our students thorough background in economics and political science, but our true goal is to help each one develop into a wiser and better person, capable of meeting more successfully all of the responsibilities which he must later assume. And I think that that sentiment is still alive and well here at CMC today. Back in 1963, the general education curriculum at CMC looked like this. It was pretty heavy, but there were a lot of ex exceptions rooted in that. Everyone had to take a core set of requirements in the humanities and social sciences, math, science, and specifically statistics and accounting. And each of these had a number of exceptions that could underlie it, for example. But the one that I found most enjoyable was for our physical education requirement, which required um, the students to take PE two times a week, every week, for two years, unless waivers were granted to married students living with their families, students working unusually long hours, and to those who are physically unfit. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sure that at the time, being physically unfit meant that you lost your leg in the war. But, you know, today, being physically unfit makes you a good candidate for taking physical education classes. <laughs> and the college also required students to undertake instruction in the operation of the college's IBM 1620 digital computer system. And I had to go to the internet and find a picture from the Museum of History and Industry in Seattle to show you what the IBM 1620 digital computer system was like. And for those of you who were here back then, do you remember that she had a nickname? Irma? That's right. <laughs> and uh, as, I under as I understood, there were um, days when there would be a sign on the door to the room where this machine was held that said, Irma's sick today. If, if it were down or, or not functioning to its full capacity. And I'm not quite sure what instruction in the operation actually meant. So you, you ran it. Do you remember what instruction in the operation meant? Okay. <laughs> but as you can imagine, the computing capabilities at the college have developed since 1963. I also find that a lot of the photos that help us understand ourselves in the, in the catalog, things that we thought would be good recruiting tools for students coming to the college in future years, I think they're really interesting. And the, the first one that caught my eye was the annual rodeo. And you see that there are a couple strapping young men there who have a, a calf and a headlock. <laughs> Then there's the Christmas dance, which seems to uh, emphasize the fact that while this is a men's college, you do have access to women. They are, they are available and present in Claremont, and some of them dress up nice for a fancy occasions. <laughs> and of course, the athletics program features prominently. And you can see that our cheerleaders there are all male, and uh, our pet band is all male. And I find particularly interesting the torch and pitchfork style mob that they have for the pep rally. 
<laughs> we had a young Andre Previn as one of our featured guests at the Athenaeum. Look at how young he is there. And the student union. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's clear to you from where you sit, but that is a box of carnation milk that's in the center of the table. And clearly that was the beverage of choice for students in 1963. <laughs> and we also featured prominently the beautiful campus at CMC where students could take instruction on the grass and lounge barefoot in the sunshine while learning from a sage on a stool. And for those of you who are here in a different decade, let's take a look at some of the representation of the college from 1993. You'll see that we still are featuring our technological prowess. And I believe that this one, what, what makes it so interesting is that there's a female student because by now CMC has had women for several years. The general education requirements at the time are reduced almost by half compared to what they were in the mid 60s. Students had to still take a wide distribution of courses across the departments at the college, but they didn't have to take as many, and there are fewer exceptions, but exceptions nonetheless. So at this point in the college's history, students with advanced preparation, uh, potentially AP classes, or a very good high school background could waive some of the general education requirements and it's greatly reduced from the expectations of the 1960s, in part because we'd changed by this time the way that the college delivered its education. We'd moved from a credit hour system where students are taking five courses per term to a system where students are taking four courses per term and courses are valued by course units. So there are fewer courses students are taking in general. And in 93, women feature prominently in the catalog. And it's, uh, it's great to see the Athenas represented just as frequently as the stags. I loved this photo. We recently lost our dear friend and colleague, Sven Arndt. He passed away at the end of March. And there's a photo of him in the 1993 catalog that I just couldn't resist. Uh, and I'm sure that he's, uh, he's written every one of those things up there in chalk on that long blackboard that's at the back of the room. We had uh, William F. Buckley as an Athenaeum guest at the time, and he is there in the uh, parents' library, I believe, having a conversation with a couple CMC students. And Kersey Black with his, um, I think that's an Apple IIc computer, and uh, you can see his glorious um, Tom Selleck-inspired mustache, which he has more recently um, gotten away from. There's a picture of him from the Keck Science website that I, that I scrounged from our web as well. But he's still here and still employed at CMC and teaching chemistry to our students just like he was back in 93. This one I thought was fantastic because how many buildings do you identify among these people? I believe we have um, George Roberts, Jack Stark, Henry Kravis, and that might be Robert Day. That is Robert Day. Robert Day. You see that he's sporting a cigar in his right hand. And uh, when I, s I couldn't, I wasn't sure who that individual was because his back is turned. I circulated this picture to Jack and Jill Stark, and Jill said, Oh, that's Robert Day. He's the only person who would smoke a cigar at commencement. <laughs> but we see we've got uh, some incredible benefactors and folks who are still benefactors today of the college. Then if we take a look at today's catalog, there is no physical paper catalog anymore. The catalog exists as a content management system on the web, and it's contracted by a vendor, but we still try to represent a lot of the same things that are important to us in that document, including our general education requirements, which look remarkably the same as those in 1993. In many other colleges and universities across the country, um, the distribution of general education courses in a departmental uh, representation is greatly diminished. And now more colleges are likely to represent their general education requirements in terms of educational objectives. So you need to take courses that are going to develop you as a writer or that are going to develop your quantitative skills, but that are not necessarily you have to take freshman composition or you have to take introductory calculus. 
and a variety of courses can be used to satisfy those various requirements at these institutions. At CMC, we still have a broad distribution of general education requirements that looks quite the same as it did back in 1993. And at this point, exceptions have largely been eliminated to the curriculum. So the general education curriculum is the general education curriculum that all students take. And even if you are married and working unusually long hours and have uh, and are physically unfit, you still have to take physical education courses. But you may have the opportunity to take a meditation course or to take a CPR course or something that would be accessible to you in a different way. It's not like you have to go out there and do uh, cats or run hurdles or um, swim across the pool. So our general education requirements today, the exceptions are available to students in foreign language. And foreign languages, we allow students to place out of their language requirement based on proficiency. It's still a proficiency requirement rather than a course requirement. If you come in to CMC and you don't have any language background or you want to learn a brand new language, you're going to take three courses in it to satisfy your language requirement. But if you are a native speaker of another language, you're an international student, or you come from a high school where you have exceptionally good preparation and have demonstrated competency through a placement exam or an AP exam, you could test out of language. And we, have, uh, we still have the practice of not requiring a senior thesis of students in our 3-2 engineering programs. But otherwise, there are no exceptions remaining. In our current catalog, we feature prominently the beautiful landscape of CMC in Southern California. The photos are now in color, and we have a view here from the fourth floor of the Kravis Center overlooking the roof garden and Scripps. A gorgeous view from that same, uh, that same floor of Kravis taking a look down the mall with the Kravis Cube. Some of our features photos also appear on the website where you'll see, again, the faculty member and his students. In this case, it's Bill Asher. Our championship athletic teams, student organizations of which we're exceptionally proud, like Model UN, and our prize winners, Robert McGregor being the most recent um, class of 2013 who won a prestigious Luce Fellowship. We also like to feature all of our students and see them in their sort of natural habitat and the various celebrations that they undertake. To give you a kind of lineup of where these requirements for the general education curriculum look then and now, I thought it would be good to give you a table where you can see how they compare from year to year. We had in English literature two courses in exam down to one course that still remains one course but has since been rebranded as our freshman writing seminar. In um, accounting, back in the mid-60s, our students were required to take one to two courses depending on their curriculum. Now we don't mandate that students take, take accounting. They still plenty of them do. And we have an exceptional accounting faculty here in our economics department. But it's not mandatory. Neither is statistics. But again, we still offer statistics across the curriculum, not just in economics, but also in psychology, political science, <laughs> mathematics, and other places across the consortium where you would expect to find it. And PE, we're still requiring the kids to demonstrate their physical fitness. Looking back at the additional humanities requirement, um, they were categorized in the 60s as a requirement, but a requirement of electives. So you had to take some electives in the humanities, which is another way of saying you don't just get to narrowly focus on the courses in your major. You need to spread out a little bit more broadly and enjoy all of the courses that we could bring to bear for you in literature, philosophy, history, and other disciplines across the consortium that could be offered at our sister institutions. We didn't, interestingly enough, require history in 1963. We probably covered most of what we would consider history in our freshman uh, Western Civ requirement or the four-course Western Civ social sciences requirement that students had to take back then and that we now have dedicated in our history department. And our history department is enormously conservative about which um, courses students can use to satisfy their requirement. They will allow students to satisfy their requirement only with a course taught by a CMC faculty member on the CMC campus. 
they won't accept a transfer credit, they won't accept a course from Scripps, they won't accept an AP score. And so they, they take very seriously their obligation to educate our students in history. And of course, the senior thesis remains with an exception for students who are either admitting to graduate school early or completing a 3-2 <coughs> engineering curriculum. And I think that's reasonable because quite honestly, if you're gonna earn two degrees and dedicate five years to your undergraduate education, we'll give you a buy on the big paper. So I, before we let our panel take over and take questions from you, I wanted to throw a little quiz because it wouldn't be an educational session if I didn't ask you a few questions. Does anybody remember when CMC last offered Saturday classes? Anybody got a guess? 85? 68? 72. Okay, so let's see who's closest. 72 is the closest. We've, I, d I don't know if the folks from Alumni and Development can pass out, like gi give him a, a pin or a tchotchke or something. <laughs> <laughs> All the bagels you want. <laughs> There's an acai bowl out there with your name on it. <laughs> yeah, we used to offer classes three days per week and they were either Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday classes ceased to appear on offer in the fall 1971. And what about the last day CMC offered exams on Saturdays? We used to have a six-day exam schedule for finals. Anybody remember? We hung on to Saturday exams for quite a while. Fall of 2002 was when we ceased to require Saturday exams. And let me tell you, right now, the students complain bitterly, and the faculty do too, if they have an exam on Friday of the exam week. And so I... <laughs> I have been here now long enough that I can say, well, you don't remember back in the day when we had exams on Saturday, you should be grateful it's only on Friday. Yeah, that doesn't cut any ice with these folks. <laughs> so. Any idea when CMC changed from semester hours to course units? Some of you were probably here when it happened. 65, any other guess? Fall of 66. I think that's one. I think that counts. Yeah. So he gets a bagel too. <laughs> so starting this year, we had we converted the course credit and um, transcripting systems here at the college to move from five courses per semester, with a typical course being three semester hours, to being a course unit system where students take four courses per semester, and every course, no matter how much time you dedicate to it, is valued at one course unit. What about the swim test? Ah, the dreaded swim test, where the weekend before graduation, there were a bunch of people frantically trying to prove themselves in the pool. <laughs> Any guesses? 86? 89. Fall of 89 is when it, uh, it last appeared, so. And then, anybody know when we started requiring the senior thesis? It's one of the hallmarks of our general education curriculum, and so everyone thinks it has existed since time immemorial, but it actually was not among our original first requirements. 1958, which is actually fairly, you know, it's the first time it appears in the, in the catalog. But students who are 3-2 engineers or students who admit early to graduate school have never had to complete one. And of course, we're all concerned about the rising cost of education, and so for, for those of you who need to take a deep breath, this is what it looks like. So this is the sticker shock of <laughs> what we were looking at for tuition, room and board and fees, and just to provide some sort of comparison, I gave you the price of um, the average new home in America in each year. So you can get a sense of how much the tuition cost rates relative to other expenses that would be a major investment or undertaking. I thought in 1963 it was also uh, interesting that we had brought some more housing online and so we had different pricing structures in place for different on-campus housing. Can you guess what the cheaper on-campus housing was for? North Quad. <laughs> <laughs> you live in North Quad, you get a little break on the price. You wanted to live in the flossy new Mid Quad, well then you're going to pay an extra $20 a year. <laughs> but through it all, we're still CMC. 
And so that's the, that's the end of the formal presentation. I'd like to open it up for you to ask questions of our panelists or to reflect on your own experiences. So we're, we're here to answer any questions that you might have or that this presentation has inspired. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Everyone give the panel a big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> and just a reminder to talk uh, close to the mic. So if you have to bring it a little bit closer, go ahead and uh, do that. And we've got a question over here. And Cameron's on the other side. We'll also take questions. We'll go back and forth. Just raise your hand. I, I know that in, the, in edu higher education in general, we've seen a terrific decline in writing abilities in incoming students over the past 25 to 30 years. But have you seen any, any change in writing abilities among students admitted to CMC? Well, uh, none of us up here teaches writing. I think that um, our faculty are generally um, of the mind that our students come in with adequate capabilities, but that they can do a lot better. And they take seriously their responsibility to improve student writing fluency. The biggest challenge that I think we experience today that we were not experiencing um, in the comparison years is the number of students who come to us where English is not their first language. And we have a, about a 17% population of F1 visa students. Some of them, English is their first language, but a great number of them are non-native English speakers. So the most resources that we have recently thrown at developing writing capabilities at the college are geared towards those students who need to develop not only their writing capabilities in general, but who need to develop those capabilities in English. And that, to me, stands out as the, the greatest um, you know, sort of point of stress and development in writing at the college. I'd like to add something to that. Um, I created two years ago um, an ad hoc committee on writing because precisely I was interested in that question and worried about it, frankly, whether the problem you describe is real or not. And I must say the evidence isn't entirely clear. Um, we have a faculty member who has been here for 40 years or so, and for all those years he's actually kept track for each paper that was written of a separate writing score, uh, both in style and in, uh, you know, grammatical errors, clarity, structure, you know, various sub-elements and so on. And so actually it was interesting to look at his 40-year trend and essentially there was no trend. You always had some people who really are phenomenal, express themselves with clarity and beauty and elegance and some who really kind of need some serious work. And there was actually no particular trend in a way. That said, there, there is a worry about it. And so we have actually, I think we do an enormous amount of work on, on writing still today. I think it's still a hallmark of the college as, as much as it must have been in your time. I would say that easily half of the faculty have in their classes specific uh, goals to encourage better writing and spend a significant amount of time giving specific feedback on writing related aspects of anything. And, and the new thing now, by the way, is actually speaking, where there's a bigger concern with, with speaking as well. And in that respect, I think our students on average uh, far exceed students I've known anywhere else. And I've been at some good places in my life. Uh, CMC students speak with greater poise, clarity, confidence, um, effectiveness, frankly, than other students. But nonetheless, they can still improve. And so many faculty work on this now. And even our Center for Writing and Public Discourse, as of this year, has started investing more on the public discourse side of, of Well, I, I think this, it's clear uh, from my m many years of teaching here is that the level of writing and speaking from freshman to senior increases enormously. And it doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm a chemist. But uh, among the other disciplines, they must be doing a fantastic job. I know, I know many f uh, faculty who tell me their techniques for improving writing, and, and they're incredibly labor-intensive. So I think I think uh, it's it's a great it's a gr it's a great testament to them. They they're just they're just terrifically hard workers, and they get our students up to a very high level. I see the result in senior theses in science. Teaching intro chemistry, I rarely ask them to write anything because I don't have any patience. 
I started out by saying, define a normal boiling point. And they started with, a normal boiling point is when? Well, normal boiling point is a noun, not a adverb. So I, I'd say, <laughs> I said, from now on, it's quantitative. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, when they get to the senior level, they're writing beautifully. And, and we have oral presentations, and they speak beautifully. So I think uh, my colleagues, I can't, I can't include myself on this, I, I do a magnificent job of, with our students in that regard. Some, some of you will remember uh, uh, Phelps and, and Thompson, and uh, they were both, if you, if you turned in a paper for them, uh, it came back full of uh, red ink. Uh, they were both, and, and Proctor put out a pamphlet in his class about writing, and they were both, of course, economists. Uh, one of them, uh, a fan of labor unions, clear to the left, and the other one um, wrote a m monogram about greed is good and then the praise of, of Scrooge. So uh, we had real diversity there, but they both really emphasized writing. The other thing I want to say, I'm, I don't understand when, when the catalog said senior thesis, because when I was here, when I graduated in 57, everyone took a senior thesis. And I think through the 50s, at least from 53 onward, everyone took the senior thesis. Now, I'm, maybe there was a way to get out of it, but if there was, they certainly didn't tell me. Yeah, my, my understanding. Do you my have a copy of it, Jack? Yeah, my <laughs> best guess on that one, Jack, is that it was an unstated requirement, that it was so baked into our expectations of how students would satisfy their um, majors or satisfy their, um, you know, it, it wasn't stated as a GE requirement. It was baked into something else. Discipline. Yeah. Yeah, disciplinary. Or, or yeah, 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 major. Yeah. Well, it would, it certainly, I think most everyone wrote one. Um, if you, if you could get out of it, uh, I would have been happy to get out of it. But uh, <laughs> the, the other thing I want to say about general requirements, CMC, uh, as colleges goes these days, has a, has a broader uh, general education requirement th than most colleges. And, and liberal arts is defined by your distribution of college. It isn't, it isn't majoring in literature. It's that you have an understanding of uh, history, literature, uh, science, mathematics, et cetera, et cetera. We, we do more than, than most. Uh, my cynical view is one of the reasons that this has uh, gone away, not as much as it used to be, where you used to have this Western Civ course that all colleges, for the most part, had. And uh, in the 50s, it went uh, every year. You took a, a course every year. In your senior year, you took a course in, course in ethics. Uh, part of the reason that disappeared, faculty don't like to teach it. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're a, um, a historian, they want you to also talk about um, uh, the literature of the period or, or a different period, which you may not know. Uh, so they've substituted these these general classes where you looked at the flow of history and literature and architecture and such like through, through the ages and how one age led to another to more specific courses in their own disciplines. So that's, that's you could say partially educationally driven, but I would say significantly driven by the desire of professors. We're where some of you were here, some of you old timers out there, you took your senior humanities course from uh, Golo Mann, who was Thomas Mann's son. As part of that, he was dealing in the period of the uh, First and Second World War. You read Budenbrooks. Uh, now, there are not many professors today who, uh, unless they are either a litter professor, who, who are going to require you to do something like that. I was wondering if you could uh, talk about three sort of integrated areas. One is about the quality of the students coming in, what's, what's happening in that area, and then what do you see happening once they're here in terms of how hard the classes are, how hard the grading is, what, how you are addressing that. And then third, do we have any performance metrics in terms of how well 
our students do relative you know, to the past LSATs or other kinds of testing, um, you know, what's happening with our students? Well, we don't have, um, we don't have good data on the outcomes for things like the LSAT or the GRE, in part because not everyone takes them. And those tests have also evolved over time, so you can't norm a version from 20 years ago with a, a version that's offered today. But the college does have a pretty rigorous uh, set of requirements for admission, and it's not just our um, not just our board scores, for example. But students need to have high test scores. They need to have rigorous high school preparation in terms of having taken the right kinds of classes, and um, they also have to demonstrate certain sense of agency in order to demonstrate that they are the go-getter kind of person that we want at this college. And so I think that our students demonstrate for all of those sort of testing points at admission a high level of competence. And they come here strong. Most of them are coming to us as like the big fish from their high school, right? And then they come here and they're at CMC and suddenly they're in a pond that is potentially smaller than their high school, but it's stocked with all these big fish because they're there amongst themselves and amongst their, their peers. So the quality of the, um, of the students coming in based on their um, sort of preparation and attitude is stellar. I mean, I just have to say it's excellent. And then while they're here, we do conduct a variety of learning assessments, particularly we have to do this for our accreditation exercise. And um, if you'd like to, at the, at the end of the session, I can show you where the outcome data is on our website because we have to make it public. I just wanted to add to that, <coughs> CMC has benefited, I think, from uh, as many as three dynamics in this respect. One is we have moved up in the rankings uh, dramatically, and those rankings matter enormously for young people today who are extremely obsessed with you know, getting into a top 10 uh, college or university. And so just by being there, we have become highly desirable to the smart, to the to the kind of kids with the best scores. Number two, we do have still a distinct market position even amongst the top ten liberal arts colleges, which is that we are that place that attracts a particular kind of student who is more interested in connecting theory to practice, who is a bit more of the leadership material and wants to do stuff. Um, it, it's. And it, it allows us to attract even better students in a way. Kids who could have gotten and who do get into any of the very top universities and um, colleges in the country. And, and just as an aside, if you look at the top 10 places that our students apply to, there's really only one other liberal arts college in it, and it's in 10th position, Pomona. Um, all the other nine, one to nine, are all the major top of the line Ivy Leagues and top research universities in this country. And they often get in and still choose to come here because they buy into a particular image and a particular se uh, sense of what this place is like. And, and, and so today our admissions rate is 9%, which is really, um, I mean, quite astonishing. And uh, just a, f and a funny story, as it happens, yesterday afternoon after work, uh, my wife and I went to see a, a college counselor for our boy. And I didn't say that I was uh, vice president at CMC. Um, I just, you know, we asked questions. And he looked at my uh, boy's uh, stuff, right? And he has a GPA of 4.6 or something, which is oh, pretty darn good. <laughs> Kids works his ass off all the time. <laughs> so he has a 4.6 GPA, and he looks at it, he says, you know, places like Claremont McKenna and so on, it will be hard. He, he does, the grades are not high enough, and he needs more on the leadership. Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll try to pull some strings then. <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> which, which won't even work in any case. But the fact is we are extremely tough to get into. We get a, a cream of the cream in both uh, the capability to be, well, to score well, which I hope is sort of correlated with intelligence. And... Um, the capability to be all-rounders with a broad diversity of interests and experiences and, and so on. They're, they're really quite amazing. I sometimes wonder whether we can improve anything on them, frankly. The raw material that walks in here 
is such a small subset of society as a whole, such a small elite selected group who is like strong in nearly everything that our main job, it seems to me, is to not screw them up. Um, which we do very well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we also do teach them obviously a lot of stuff, but they come in so accomplished, so full of talent, and I it's hard not to do well by them. It's a true joy to work in a place. And I'll just add one more thing, because what Peter says is, is so true. It's difficult to measure the value we add. And so we do a lot of survey research um, and a lot of comparison with peer institutions to get assessments from our students. We do um, as objective assessment of their senior theses and various other projects, both in their majors and uh, part of the general education curriculum for general learning at the college. And we see that it's students are satisfying our expectations upon graduation. We're happy with where they are. But as Peter said, it's hard to it's hard to measure. You know, when you come in at 99% and at graduation, how do you how do you determine that 99.4% or 99.6% is that that fraction of value that you've added? But you ask any single one of our students about whether their educational experience here was satisfying, whether they grew in their intellectual capabilities, and, and they will all, to a person, say mm -hmm. that this is the most challenging and rewarding academic experience they could have dreamed of. Uh, I'm Paul Wiener. I teach at a state university in Arizona, uh, and I was particularly struck by your comment about how labor-intensive it is to, to critique and improve and teach writing because the trend in state universities, I suspect nationwide, not just in Arizona, is to be very budget conscious. Uh, the legislatures are reducing the funding that they're willing to use to support the colleges. And uh, I teach mostly seniors and their writing is generally poor. Where this bill comes from, <laughs> you know, because that's what you can achieve if you have an average class size of 15 students or something, and faculty who do put the hours in, um, that's what you pay for. It's uh, a pity not everybody can actually get it, but I'm proud that we can deliver it here. Um, I've noticed that uh, one of the college faculty speaks on the nine o'clock news here locally. Um, could you talk about other um, things that the faculty does in addition to teaching, whether it's advising in government, whether they're active in media or advising businesses? Yeah, we... An opportunity to brag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously we have, we have a number of faculty who work on items that are often in the press. Uh, probably the most well-known, but some other people in government like Andy Bush and others are also quite frequently on the news, uh, in the news, Ken Miller when it comes to um, California politics and so on. We have in our Department of Psychology, for example, um, uh, not surprisingly, maybe, some of the very most well-known uh, psychologists of leadership in the world, um, Jay Conger, uh, Ron Riggio, David Day, uh, that trio, any top-of-the-line research university would dream of having them here. And so they also often uh, speak at corporations and at sort of uh, contexts and, and provide advice out there. We have, in our Department of Philosophy, for example, we have some faculty who is very engaged, actually, with, um, with the community around them. Um, Alex Rachi, for example, is on three ethics boards of three different hospitals in the region, which, you know, it might not be visible on TV, but it's a way of making an impact in the community around that truly matters. Uh, in psychology, some of our faculty are specialists. Two of them are actually amongst the top specialists in the U.S. of psychology or and law and justice systems, and they, they work on all kinds of um, experiments determining how juries, for example, uh, react to evidence if it's the exact same evidence is presented in different words. Eh? And so, as you can imagine, it's of an extreme relevance to people in, in the judicial sector. So they often consult and speak about that. My, my sense is that in nearly every department, you'll find some people who, by the nature of their research, um, have that sort of a direct impact on the professional communities that they work with. And some of them happen to be more TV or of interest to the media, and hence you see them even more. 
Some of them, it might not be that the media is interested a lot, but their impact is just as big in their field. Those guys. <laughs> yeah, well, <coughs> we, we have a couple of uh, faculty who are on the uh, American Academy of Sciences, I, which is very unusual for a liberal arts college. Uh, I, I was for years on the scientific review panel for the state of California, Cal EPA, which is the panel that's, uh, that makes recommendations on toxic, toxic air contaminants. So, so we, we have people doing that uh, also. So one has to look at what is valued at the college. And this college will value those sorts of things but they also value research and basic research in, in, in uh, refereed journals, which of course competes, right? Uh, I myself prefer for me to do research that goes into refereed journals. That's my preference. I did the toxic, I did the, uh, S, uh, the scientific review panel because I was asked to do it and, and uh, I, cause I, they didn't particularly like me there because they, they all came from UCLA and uh, UC Berkeley, but, but, but we got along. And, and we managed to do some nice things. But, the, uh, but uh, we, do ha we do have faculty in environment, have interest in environment. We have the, the uh, Roberts, which is no longer in science, but the, the, the environmental uh, Center, right, and, uh, and and we've done that sort of stuff. So, uh, and and we have within political science uh, people of a journalistic nature, right? Uh, Pitney uh, was mentioned. Uh, others, uh, Kessler, Kessler. There, there there are several who do those sort of things. Now, there's always there's always a tension within a, within a, a faculty whether or not you value this. And I happen to think you do. And I think a majority of faculty agree with, agree with me on that. So, but there is that tension because some people just uh, sit down like I do and, uh, with a pencil and paper and a computer and, and, and grind out research, right? Uh, I prefer that personally, but that's my preference. But I do value what other people do in this area. Oh, uh, I'm class of 78. My son's graduating in three weeks here, and, and he was one of those 99% kids in our high school in Bellingham, Washington. You guys have done a tremendous job. Unbelievable the growth he's experienced in four years. And he already was kind of a pretty good kid before you got a hold of him. But here's my question. I was reading the Wall Street Journal that the Department of Justice has issued some uh, warning letters to Pomona College as one and some of the Ivy League schools for antitrust violations in the admissions process the early admissions is, do you think that's going to have a big effect? Uh, what's what's going to happen? Well, uh, we were also served with a um, with that same notice from the DOJ to to not destroy records, and s all it is right now is a hold on our normal records retention schedule. We've received no information about whether anybody's coming around to look at our practices, but we, you know the. The question that that investigation seeks to answer is whether institutions are colluding on early decisions for early decision admission. And frankly, for CMC, it's come, up, come on down, take a look at whatever you want to take a look at. You know, we have nothing to, nothing to fear in this investigation. Um, but that's, yeah, we are swept up in it. And right now, our, our particular interest is to just hang on to stuff. This, this is a, a ridiculous suit. I mean, uh, quite, quite, quite frankly, uh, a, a student signs a, a, a statement that uh, if, if he's admitted early, uh, he will withdraw from other colleges. Uh, it's, it's clear that we will share this information. There's no collusion here. Um, uh, you can make the case I don't know. I'm, I don't want to make this case, but you can make the case. This is more the administration getting after the elite colleges than anything else. The, 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 the Justice Department has to have better things to do than than this than this case. I, I realize this is pretty harsh, but that, that but 
but I think that's true. And thank you for the testimonial about your son. <laughs> <laughs> you pointed out that the curriculum still requires a fair number of liberal arts courses, a broad spectrum. But it seems that one of the perceptions of the college these days is that it's management consulting, investment banking, the day school is a finance focus, economics and finance seem to be more strongly, more prominent, at least perception-wise or conversationally. Could you comment about that? And the corollary is, could you comment about the other disciplines, the other majors like philosophy and others that don't appear to have as much prominence but are essential to a liberal arts education? Yes. That's actually one of the most fascinating questions about this place. I have only been here three years, so I still look at it with a degree of outsiderness, although by now also deep love and a feeling of belonging. But still, there seems to be an image there that in part the students themselves reproduce that this is what this college is all about. The facts in good part belie that, but the answer is more nuanced. So to some extent, we are proud of that history that comes from the quote from, pr uh, from uh, President Benson 50 years ago, right? That focus on uh, government and business, which by now has broadened. But nonetheless, it is true that our two biggest departments are government and the Robert Day School. Um, with science, frankly, immediately running behind and actually in, uh, yes, with science immediately running behind. Um, when you look at the actual data, so all our students take Econ 50, it's pretty much 99% do. The same holds for Gov 20, which is, these are both general education requirements, and both these departments don't allow you any choice. You take this course and that's it. Econ 50 is Principles of Economics, Gov 20 is, what's the title of it? Introduction to American Politics. Uh, introduction to American Politics. And so they take those. But beyond that, you actually see a wide range, and about 50% of our students, after having taken Econ 50, actually never take another Econ course again, which tells you something maybe about how much they enjoy the Econ 50. <laughs> um, and that's what it is. You know, 50% of the students here never take a second Econ course. That is not a college where only Econ matters. Now. About 35% of our students major in something that has econ in it, which is a higher proportion than at my previous place. Uh, I, when I came here, I came from Amherst College. It was less out there. Nonetheless, even there, the proportion of students graduating in economics was dramatically rising every year as well, and in sciences and in computer science. That's a national trend. We may have been a little bit ahead of that by the nature of our market position, but we truly are not actually a place, as a matter of empirical fact, where everybody is an econ major. Everybody is not. 60% of them are not. And so it's interesting how that image exists. And I think it comes in part as well from not only our historical legacy, which actually we are proud of and don't want to destroy at all, but it also comes from this notion that the Robert Day School is the only one that's a school and not a department because of the sig significant amount of money that Robert Day has given to it. Um, and, and, but in, in many ways, the funding that Robert Day so graciously gave to the college has allowed the college as a whole to become stronger. The Department of Economics has obviously become stronger, but frankly, so have all the other parts of the college, and they have grown up together uh, maybe as a matter of fact, if you look back over the last 20 years, the parts of the college that have become the strongest and grown the most are probably, in my opinion, I would say uh, history is an amazingly strong department. Philosophy is, I'm very sure, the top philosophy department in liberal arts in the country. And even amongst all universities and colleges combined, our philosophy department is one of the very best in the nation. Math, we are amazingly strong in math. Um, we have some of the, the top young mathematicians in the country. Um, so it is not the case, actually, that this place is focused solely on Gov and Econ, although it is still proud of the strength it has in that. Um, but the students seem to sometimes rile themselves up that the only place where the action is is Econ. You've got to be out there. You've got to be a Robert Day scholar. And, and, and you know, I tend to contradict them and say, follow your heart, do what you want to do here. Uh, and between our 10 departments and the 30, 40 in the con consortium where you can also major, everything's open to you. 
Yeah, I, I, I would uh, I, maybe a, a slightly old-fashioned view, but I think it's still, it's still prevalent. TMC is a liberal arts college with a focus. In other words, it has a distinctive nature, and and you've discussed that nature, econ and government, and we have very strong departments throughout the college. But if you look at the number of faculty, econ and government, because students who are interested in econ and government come here. But those who are interested in history, they also come here, science and philosophy. But uh, people s talk about the distinct nature as being a marketing tool, but it's also the nature. I mean, our very nature is that. And, and uh, the dean mentioned the 35% the of the students who graduate with econ in their major, right? Econ, math, and all those sorts of things. Three two programs, those programs are robust. You go to three two programs at other colleges, and and these three two programs are with econ. You go to three two programs at other colleges, you discover there are no no one taking the course. Here they are, and they're, and they're getting into good gra they're getting into good schools, Columbia, uh, and so on. So so uh, I I would argue, and, and maybe it is an argument, but I would argue that to look at CMC as a liberal arts college with a distinctive nature, and that is the focus in those areas. I don't think we've changed from that. Well, we, we've probably changed, but I think we still have that as our mantra. And, uh, and, and if it were up to me, it would continue. Yeah, I, I want to, on that, so it's, we've always been a liberal arts college with focus in leadership and business government and professions. Uh, now, I say that when I was at CMC, I was a humanities major with emphasis in literature and philosophy. But the focus of the college and the marketing of the college has always been in that leadership area. Most small colleges try to do too much. Therefore, don't do anything very well. So uh, we don't offer sociology. We don't offer anthropology. There's a number of things we don't offer. now. Being within the Claremont Colleges gives us strength to do that. But it's also a matter of, of, of focusing your resources uh, if you're going to stay a small college. And, and we have been uh, wise enough to uh, continue to do that, where, where many small colleges do not. I think also that um, our faculty in the economics programs contribute to the liberal arts nature of this place. They support the liberal arts nature of this place. The interdisciplinarity and the contributions that they make to curricula that um, they lend their courses to and lend their support to is phenomenal. The work that they do in science management, in 3-2 engineering, in international relations, in um, sort of the study of political economy, and PPE, the one of our hallmark interdisciplinary programs. The interdisciplinary programs it, at Claremont McKenna typically involve economics. And so economics is not only a silo, an island unto itself uh, that is hoarding resources and talent. It is a contributor to the liberal arts education and it enriches students in other disciplines and other majors beyond its, uh, it, the third floor of Bauer Hall. One more point. So when I was at Amherst, I had to, um, I led a strategic planning process for two years. And after two years, we had finally the plan. And you could have taken the word Amherst out of it and replaced it with the word Swarthmore or with the word uh, Williams, and the plan would have read just as right. However, you could not have put the term CMC in there. It would not have worked. We truly are, as a liberal arts college, as a top liberal arts college, I think the only one that has a distinction, that has a, a, a focus and an identity that is all its own. And, and I love it, for example, that we only have 10 departments. It allows us to be in those 10 really good, really good. Not just halfway there or whatever, but really good. We have 16 faculty or so in history. We have 11 in philosophy. Can you imagine this? We only have 1,200 or so students. That's one philosopher per 100. If you did this at University of Arizona, they would have to have 10,000 philosophers on staff. <laughs> but, I mean, it's amazing what we can achieve by focusing on a few things and doing them really well. 
and, and, and then doing that within the context, obviously, of the five colleges, which uh, allows us to some extent to compensate for what we're not doing well, right? Which is anthropology <laughs> and whatever. Uh, it's a quite an ideal situation, and, and the people who for decades have actually stuck to that model made brilliant choices, I think, because it allows us to be really good at what we do. I used to tell students um, who were admitted that uh, they can come to CMC and, and major in anything offered in any of the Claremont colleges. Uh, we don't offer sociology, but you could come and be a major in sociology, and every year we have some. On the other hand, if you know you want sociology, don't select CMC. And don't select CMC unless you want to be surrounded by students that are interested in public policy, outgoing, vigorous group. Uh, so, you know, we want to select students who want us, who want what we have to offer, and are going to go out and be leaders in, the, in our society. Uh, talk about the drinking policy and the evolution of it. It's fascinating to me. You know, I, uh, two of my boys went here uh, maybe 15 years apart. Um, both of them lived in the North Quad. One of them was, I don't, I don't know what they call it, the social. He was the guy that would go to see the dean of students saying, we want to have this party. And we're gonna, and this and that. And, and he would negotiate with the dean and then the dean would approve some version of that. And then 15, 15 years later, my youngest boy comes, who's now 30. And he, one day we were talking on the phone when he was a freshman. And uh, he says, Dad, he says, I can't believe this place. It's like summer camp without counselors, <laughs> which I think is a, a compliment, but you know, coming from the 60s, we had a number of these off-campus parties and this and that. And to the extent that the college has accomplished what it has by containing things that 19 to 22-year-olds do, how, how, how did you pull it off? And, and how are you able to continue with the policy that we have um, without dealing with lawyers all the time. <laughs> Jack, you want to start that one off? Why not get Tori's son to talk about it? <laughs> Tori's in the room. He is. <laughs> oh, oh, look, I don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly what you're, you're commenting on, uh, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say this. When, when they used to drive drinking off the campus, Every year, uh, within the Claremont Colleges, there would be one or two automobile deaths coming down from Mount Baldy, where, where, uh, and, and that was a combination of driving it off campus and the fact that women had parietal hours. You had to get down that mountain to get her back to their dorm by 11 o'clock or whatever it was. Uh, so they have, they have um, recognized that, that 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 was a destructive policy. On the other hand, I think you can go too far in being too liberal on the campus and not not uh, correcting some of the the drinking problems primarily that happen. Quite frankly, I don't understand today's generation uh, in this binge drinking stuff. Uh, uh, it makes no sense to me at all. But it, and then that's a problem that's not only here, but, but, but elsewhere. And I think the college needs to control that in some ways better than they're controlling it right now. But uh, you, you need to have a healthy atmosphere. And, uh, it, 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 and if you go, you know, you're looking for an Aristotelian golden mean here somewhere, <laughs> and it's hard to find. Tori can maybe give a few comments to that. because of what you're dealing with as a dean. <laughs> um, the, it's complicated, and there's, I'll try to give you a brief um, overview here. Uh, when you think about the maturation that takes place between the age of 18 and 22, 
and that's mostly what we have, traditionally age students at CMC. That's the big challenge, but the, the change uh, came when uh, the Drug Free Schools and Communities Act became law, and it forced colleges and universities <coughs> to enforce the drinking codes and all of that kind of thing. So that's when things got a little more organized. Large events have to be fenced. You have to have a, an ID to get into them. You have to have an ID if you go up to a bar to get a beer. Um, and it's interesting, um, my, in my tenure at the college, I would say anecdotally what I've seen is waves. You have, you, you, something starts, some kind of drinking habit. And the one that we're, we're challenged with today, uh, and I'm not dealing with it directly anymore, is mixing alcohol with drugs. Um, and that's, uh, so what will happen is you'll see some uh, behavior tick up. Think of sine and cosine waves from your math days. The institutional response will follow. The behavior will slowly trail off. The institutional response will stay heavy handed for a while. It will flatten out. But what you have to do is get through a seven year window where you've graduated everybody who remembers what happened before you start dealing with the next one again. It's just, it, there's no perfect answer to it because alcohol and is, is always been part of the scene. Great. Hi, I'm, I'm Peter Hong. I'm um, the Associate Vice President of Public Affairs and Communications here. Uh, I don't deal directly with this. This is the uh, uh, Student Affairs, Vice President of Student Affairs, Sharon Basso and Dean of Students, Diana Turner Graves. They're around if you have specific questions on this, but I, I wanted to address a couple of things that came up here as far as our current practices go. From what I know, just indirectly from overhearing things in meetings and, and being in some <coughs> meetings where things are discussed, even though this isn't something I work directly on. I do want to say that what's been very remarkable to me coming to, I just came to CMC in September, is how hands-on um, the student life staff is here. Um, on uh, at the weekend parties, Vice President Basso and Dean of Students, Diana Turner Graves, and their staffs are walking around actively monitoring students, uh, making sure everyone's okay, paying a whole lot of attention. They know these students by name, and they actually know the history um, uh, of students who have uh, had concerns. So, um, I mean, I, I was just uh, so impressed by that coming here that I'd never seen a college where staff at that level was so hands-on. And um, I, I just also learned that since 2014, uh, all of our orientation guides for the first year uh, students have eight days of training on a variety of, of safety issues, I including alcohol and substance issues. Uh, and then there's a lot of follow-up. So I, I believe we do have a more liberal uh, alcohol policy than the other five Cs. Um, I was an alumni trustee at Occidental, and I, it's certainly much more liberal um, than the policy there. Uh, so accompanying that, there's a great deal of responsibility taken um, by staff and students uh, to ensure that, um, that there are high standards for personal accountability and responsibility. And I think that has really been ramped up in the last three or four years. So I don't know if that addresses your question. So someone who was here seven or eight years ago might not be as aware of that. Yeah. Hi, I'm the chair of the Student Affairs Committee on the Board of Trustees, and this is obviously been a topic that we've spent a lot of time on over the last four or five years. And I think we've gone through a transition where <clears throat> four or five years ago we saw a really exponential growth in binge drinking. And so we tried to put in restrictions that at the en in the end didn't work very well. And so now what uh, Sharon and her folks have been focused on is building a sense of responsibility among students. And so all the new efforts that have gone on the last two years have been with students so that they're taking responsibility so that when they see their friends and fellow students getting out of line or drinking too much, that they're there to help them. And we found that that has been much more effective and also having Sharon and Diana and other residential life people at parties and on campus and that sort of thing. But trying to create a sense of community standards 
so that in the end, the, peop- the stu- students of this age will listen to their peers more so than administrators. And to the extent they're saying, you know, you're drinking too much or you're going to, you know, you're doing things here that are irresponsible or that are offensive or, you know, whether this is in the area of drinking or sexual harassment. As an example, every case of sexual harassment we've had in the last year, in the last five years, has involved drinking. And so that's when people get out of hand. And so uh, rather than trying to, you know, put in really strict uh, almost like quasi law enforcement types of restrictions, which then what happens, what we found is people just go inside and they drink in their dorms and they hide it. Um, and then you don't, you're, you're, you don't see the, the, the problems that are developing. We're really trying to build a sense of responsibility and it, it fits with the ethos of the school. Um, that, that people have to take responsibility for their community and the people around them. And uh, I have to say that um, Sharon and DT have just done an incredible job. I met with all the RAs two weeks ago, uh, and they've said, you know, the whole s- sense of responsibility and attitude has changed. It doesn't mean there still aren't kids that, you know, end up uh, passed out drunk. It happens. Um, but it's happening a lot less and people are taking a lot more responsibility and they're offering a lot more alternative programming where there's parties and things that are going on where drinking isn't taking place. So it, it, we, we've made it significant strides in the last three years. These, these problems are much greater than when, when I was president. I mean, they're, they're coming to college having already experienced much more alcohol and other things. So the, the, the problem the college faces is greater now than it was from 70 to 2000. And in, and in those periods, it was um, some of you who were um, here in the, in the 50s, a dean would call you in and say, look, if I have any more problem with you, you're out of here. Um, and I was able to do that. Uh, now it's uh, the Jewish procedure I'd call in five or six guys who would uh, kind of tore things up, and I'd say, oh, and I'd have the dean there, and I'd say, okay, uh, if, if I have any more, hear any more problems from you guys, I'm going to have the custodians move your gear to the sidewalk, and you're out of here. No judicial procedure, no nothing. I'll use my ability for, for to expel people. You can sue to get back in. Maybe you'll win. Maybe you won't. It'll take you at least two years and a lot of money. Now, get the hell out of my office. I don't want to have hear from you anymore. (laughs) Now, you you can't do that today. Uh, But it was fairly effective in those days. (laughs) (laughs) So we one last quick question. That brings back memories of uh, Willie and Ethel's. Nobody remembers that? Okay. Um, there's a number of entities that, that rate uh, colleges every year, and they're published in the various papers. Uh, and in those ratings, uh, Pomona is generally ahead of us. I was curious, do you have any opinions or knowledge of why that might be? Oh, yeah. It's, it's because Pomona has more money. I mean, quite frankly. The value of the endowment. The <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the ranking agencies are the bane of my existence, I have to tell you. I'm not a fan because not a single one of them is seeking to advance anyone's education. They're seeking to sell magazines and get eyes on their websites and get clicks. So I, I have little patience with them, but at the same time, I recognize that they are important to um, to our reputation and to what we do. But there are some uh, some factors behind them that are so hitched to affluence and so hitched to uh, resources that you, I mean, if you look, if you look at the list of top liberal arts colleges, for example, you could pretty much order them by the value of their endowments. The uh, endowment for student. Right? Well, it, yes. it's, it's not only that. Uh, you can be number three on one rating and number thirty on another. It depends what they're evaluating, and it doesn't uh, doesn't say best for what. And if you uh, the assumption is if your SAT scores or ACT scores are higher, that's better. 
which which beyond a certain point it doesn't make any difference. You're looking for if you're looking for leadership in business government profession, you're you're looking for something else. Uh, besides, you're looking for a smart student, but something else. So uh, colleges become too obsessed with this rating business. Uh, uh, U.S. News will report the best one. If if you spend more, you're rated higher. Now, now, quite frankly, uh, the the marginal improvement in in quality of education for the marginal dollars spent, if it's 15 cents, I'd be surprised. Uh, the the uh, uh, but everyone's going to spend more, wants to do more, and all that. And, and uh, colleges spend everything, every dollar they can get their hands on, and rationalize every bit of it. Uh, so. Um, uh, these ratings, and, and, and they tend to also skew their operations to um, to do well in the ratings. You you do well if your class is under 18, so you kind of tap that class at 18 because you want to look, look good. What's the difference between 18 and 19? There's no difference at all. Uh, but so don't get obsessed. All the colleges in the top 25 are are outstanding colleges, but don't get obsessed with uh, whether you're number eight or number 14 or number three. I mean, there's, these ratings haven't been totally all good for higher education. Um, <laughs> that is all the time we have. The town hall with President Chodosh will be in this room in about 10 minutes. Uh, there are restrooms out both doors. There's also refresh on coffee, pastries, and other items uh, behind me here. Please give the panel a big round of applause. And I'm sure they'd stick around if you had some more questions. <laughs>